This is CBC Winnipeg News. A show of support from first responders today outside the funeral for a fallen firefighter. 40-year-old Preston Heinbigner is being remembered as a loving husband and father. On April 9th, the 17-year member of the Winnipeg Fire Paramedic Su Service died by suicide. Friends say he'd been struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder. Two aerial ladder trucks formed an arch in front of Springs Church as family, friends and colleagues gathered to honour his life. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Calls for more mental health supports have been growing louder in the wake of Preston Heimbigner's death. As CBC's Josh Crabb reports, firefighters say help is available, but accessing it when you need it isn't always easy. The flag flies at half mast at Fire Station 1, where Preston Heinbigner worked. The firefighter's death by suicide has sparked calls for more mental health supports. Help is available, but accessing it can be difficult, according to former firefighter Josh Clausen. He was a peer support coordinator for the Winnipeg Fire Paramedic Service and still teaches a mental health readiness program. There is hope, but the, the pathway to find it isn't always as clear as I would like it to be. Close friends and colleagues told CBC News Hein Bigner was living with post-traumatic stress disorder before his death. Clausen was also diagnosed and treated for PTSD just before leaving firefighting in 2020. He says he didn't know he was unhealthy until seeing a psychologist and speaking about a suicide call early in his career. What I thought was normal was not healthy. And I think that's... That's a similar story for a lot of firefighters and paramedics and first responders. Clausen says it's not necessarily the fires, but the nature and repetition of helping other people in crisis that takes a toll. The WFPS says those calls have been increasing. The number of total psychological claims made through the Workers' Compensation Board for paramedics and fire paramedics rose too, climbing to 236 in 2021 before falling in 2022 to 214 and 201 claims last year, according to data from the department. The WFPS has a behavioral health unit made up of a nurse and clinical psychologist, one of the factors it says that may be behind the recent drop in psychological claims. United Firefighters of Winnipeg President Tom Billis says the addition in 2021 of a behavioral health unit for the Winnipeg Fire Paramedic Service is a positive step. But Billis says the unit needs to be expanded to make sure its members can access care in a timely fashion. They're struggling in some dark, uh, we're learning in some dark places, troubled minds behind the scene. So by the time they reach out, they may not have three weeks or a month or, or six weeks or whatnot to see a psychiatrist or psychologist. Nick Carlton is a clinical psychology professor at University of Regina who specializes in research and treatment for first responders. He says they're exposed to hundreds, if not thousands, of traumatic events over their careers. You're seeing an increase in the challenges that they're facing. And so as a result of that, we have every reason to believe that if you increase the demand and increase the risk, so that's going to increase the, the propensity for injury, which means we're going to need to provide more supports. Clausen says his former employer is moving in the right direction, but he knows people are still struggling and more needs to be done. The behavioral health unit is a good thing if you can make sure that you have very clear paths that when people recognize they have an issue that they can get treatment quickly, that cost is not a barrier, that the pathways are obvious. The WFPS says once someone goes to the unit, they may be referred to its lead clinical psychologist or an outside clinician for an assessment, treatment or therapy. Josh Crabb, CBC News, Winnipeg. Stories like these can be upsetting. If you or someone you know is struggling, there is help. You can dial 988 from any phone in Canada to reach the Suicide Crisis Helpline or go to 988.ca. Neighbors of a townhouse complex in Winnipeg's Fort Rouge area say they're happy the city has ordered the buildings vacated. Crumbling bricks, exposed electrical wiring and dripping toilets are just some of the issues city inspectors identified. But as CBC's Cameron McLean reports, the owner is fighting the order. 
these townhouses on Arnold Avenue have become a source of near constant trouble for neighbors like Justin Pauls. Some really good neighbors have moved out and moved away, and I don't feel safe. Like, I don't feel safe for myself. I don't feel safe for my family. Pauls and his neighbors share stories of violence, thefts, and other suspicious behavior. Denis Gendron has lived in the neighborhood for six years. The worst of it was last summer, and there were calls constantly to the city from myself and from other people in the neighborhood. City inspectors ordered the townhouses vacated. The report notes units were divided without permits. Parts of the exterior wall have fallen away. They also found exposed wiring, rotting back steps, and one unit had toilet water dripping into a kitchen from a unit above. CBC News tried to talk with residents, but nobody answered the door. CBC also tried to contact the owner, Alan Planinch, through his lawyers, but did not receive a response. This isn't the first time the city has ordered Planinch to fix up the properties. Last May, he appealed those orders. I've never, and there is no proof, verbal and writing, that I've said that this work would not be done, nor has my property manager said that this work wouldn't be done. Planinch says realtor Rahim Mirza was acting as his property manager, a claim Mirza denies, saying he was merely trying to help Planinch sell the properties. But Mirza also disputes the issues raised by the city. I guess nothing seemed incredibly dangerous except for the fact that, you know, there were certain cosmetic uh, issues uh, that, you know, we thought should have been addressed by a new purchaser. The property owner has appealed the city's order to vacate these buildings. A hearing is set to go before the property committee on Monday. Cameron McLean, CBC News, Winnipeg. A 33-year-old woman is in critical condition after she was hit by a semi-trailer truck. It happened just after 7 last night on Henderson Highway near Layton Avenue. Police say the woman walked in front of the truck. She suffered serious injuries. The driver stayed on the scene and the woman remains in hospital. The city has added new stop signs to the Transcona intersection where 24-year-old Jordan Reimer was killed by a drunk driver in 2022. CBC intern reporter M Marshall Hodgins spoke with the young woman's parents about how they feel about the new sign as the two-year anniversary of their daughter's death approaches. Some people have... Uh sort of complained that, oh, one more stop sign and it's going to slow us down to get to work and it, it's not going to stop impaired drivers, but they're missing the point, really. It's not about the impaired driver. It's about giving the innocent victim like Jordan an opportunity to stop and to look both ways. And if she'd have seen that truck barreling at like almost 110 kilometers an hour yeah. towards her, you know, we feel confident she would never have entered the intersection and that would have saved her life. The two year date of her death is difficult, but everything's difficult. Every birthday is difficult, every celebration, every Christmas, every, I mean, how do you celebrate without your daughter? This time of year is always gonna be horrible, horrible for us, yeah. I can't put it into words, you know, it's like, ripping the scab open again. You know, we've had two meetings with the justice minister and uh, we really feel strongly that the drinking buddy who knew that Goodman was uh, impaired and verbalized to witnesses that he would not let him drive and still handed over the keys and let him drive and got in the truck with him should be held accountable. We do not understand how that cannot be seen as aiding and abetting a crime. I don't understand why there's not a process in place for when you challenge the Crowns. Um, they should feel confident that another Crown or group of Crowns will come to the same conclusion as them. They should have nothing to worry about and that's what we want. We want someone else to come in and say yes your decision is sound or maybe your decision isn't sound. I've had many people text me since yesterday and say that when they had to stop all they did was think about Jordan and think about how, how unjust it is that she's not here and how sad uh, they are for our family. And we appreciate those texts from people. A mother whose son died of an overdose wants the province to take more action on harm reduction. Yesterday, a report on Manitoba's only mobile overdose prevention site showed it changed and saved the lives of people who use drugs there. 
The report recommends setting up multiple supervised consumption sites across the province that could offer a safe supply of drugs. As the CBC's Rosanna Hempel reports, one mother says safe supply could have saved her son. Arlene Last Kolb's son Jesse died of a fentanyl overdose in 2014. Jesse sure didn't want to die. He had a house, a job, and a loving family. Last Kolb advocates through Mom Stop the Harm to make sure her grief doesn't happen to other families. She says her son might have lived if he'd had a regulated safe supply of drugs. We have a combination of toxic drugs on our street that are killing people causing huge damage to our loved ones and to our province. And I feel that we should replace that. that we should look towards regulating our drug supply so that people aren't going to the streets. That's part of what our report on Manitoba's first mobile overdose prevention site recommends. The third party review commissioned by Sunshine House suggests setting up multiple supervised consumption sites across the province. It says a safe supply of drugs could be one of many services offered at the sites. That the most important thing in harm reduction is the supply, okay? And that we won't change things enough unless we do something about the supply. The report found despite thousands of visitors who came to use drugs, no one died at the mobile overdose prevention site. It's what Lass Kolb hoped would happen. Still, 445 Manitobans had a drug-related death last year, according to preliminary provincial data. Lass Kolb is urging the province to keep moving forward on harm reduction. You will never get over if this happens to you. And if your child dies, no amount of treatment, no amount of justice, no amount of policing is going to bring them back. The province says it's doing consultations this year with the hope of opening a supervised consumption site in 2025. Rosanna Hempel, CBC News, Winnipeg. In a statement from Manitoba's Minister of Housing, Addictions and Homelessness, Bernadette Smith says the province is not looking at safe supply. She says they're focused on drug testing and launching Manitoba's first supervised consumption site. The chief of a Manitoba First Nation accused of sexual assault, sexually assaulting a child has been removed from a regional tribal council's board. Lake St. Martin Chief Christopher Traverse was charged with sexual assault and child pornography related offenses in February. The chair of the Interlake Reserves Tribal Council says the board of directors voted to remove him yesterday. He says the decision was based on the council's beliefs and what elders in Traverse's community wanted. Travers told CBC last week he will not resign as chief and maintains his innocence. The Winnipeg Jets playoff run begins this weekend at Canada Life Centre. We know the first two games will be played in Winnipeg on Sunday at 6 and Tuesday at 8.30. Games three and four will be played in Colorado at nine on Friday, the 26th, and 1.30 p.m. on Sunday, the 28th. CBC's Gavin Axelrod has more now on why fans and businesses have a vested interest in the team's success. Go Jets, go! <laughs> okay, let's decorate this town. Let's go. Winnipeg's mayor getting Donald Street whiteout ready. The first street party is Sunday. Businesses are also in playoff mode, and bartender Lucas Preciado is looking forward to it. I think it's definitely going to make this place go off the chain for busyness. I think that uh, it's going to put some money in all our pockets as well. So no complaints on my end. At local public eatery on Gary Street, staff are expecting hundreds through the doors every game. Manager Malay Piltz says that's a bonus for business. We're just excited to kind of have more people and more foot traffic in and around downtown for sure. Downtown Winnipeg Biz says thousands flocked downtown for the playoffs last year. 5,000 tickets were available for each of the first two whiteout parties this year. Both sold out. The Merchant Kitchen's executive chef Jesse Friesen 
says it's the restaurant's time to shine too. It's going to be very busy, but it's very exciting to be a part of, uh, of the culture downtown, the excitement, and just overall, you know, being a part of the playoffs. Small businesses are also getting in on the action. Will Galt runs Willie Dogs and is taking his hot dog cart to the Whiteout Street Parties downtown. Galt is working one home game per round there. The longer we can go definitely in the playoffs is not only good for them, but it's definitely good for us. When fans arrive here on Donald Street for the Whiteout Parties, True North says they can expect similar security to Canada Life Centre like metal detectors. They also say the street will be closed for several hours before and after every Whiteout Party. And fans are encouraged to arrive early. Gavin Axelrod, CBC News, Winnipeg. Drilling operations began at Imperial Oil's Southern Pipeline today. The fuel pipeline was shut down after concerns were raised about the pipeline beneath the Red River just south of St. Adolph. That pipeline brings gas, diesel and jet fuel to Winnipeg. The company says it expects the repair work to be completed by mid-June with the aim to create the least disruption possible. 10 Manitoba First Nation police recruits celebrated their graduation today in Southport. They're part of a new training program between the police service and Assiniboine Community College. They just finished six months of classroom training and are now headed out across the province for half a year of on the ground training. I was very community orientated when I was back home and I was also involved with MMIW. I have an auntie, her name is Amanda Sophia Bartlett. Um, she went missing in 1996 and my goal is just to protect my sisters. I'm the oldest out of three sisters and also protect my sisters in the community. I'm excited to learn, I'm excited to gain new experiences, I'm excited to be involved with the community, I'm excited to hopefully make a difference in other people's lives. Day. It's a graduation of uh, our first dedicated recruit class uh, for the service um, in partnership with the, the Sinaboyan Community College. We uh, they developed a, uh, a six-month recognized police uh, recruit, uh, recruit program and today's the graduation. It's challenging times because everybody's looking for, uh, looking for police officers, all police services. So uh, what we found is we're, our fo we're focusing on the communities and recruiting hard within the communities for, to get uh, First Nation candidates. Uh. As a First Nation man, I feel confident going into First Nation communities. I've seen some struggles in my own family and my own, my own experiences. So I think I can understand with what people are dealing with on the cultural side. I'm really excited to go meet the community that I'm policing. I'm going to Bird Hill and to New Boapa. I'm excited to meet you guys. I'm going to be more involved with the schools and hopefully inspire some of the young, younger people and the youth. CBC weather specialist Riley Laychuk is not here this evening in the studio with us. He is out and about down at the Winnipeg Art Gallery this evening. And Riley, while your presence is very, very missed here beside me, it's a little lonely <laughs> here. Uh, you are down looking at some beautiful things at the Art Gallery. Well, yeah, Brittany, if you're looking for a sign of spring, definitely uh, it smells like spring inside uh, Wag uh, Kumayuk here, uh, where Arts in Bloom uh, officially kicked off today, uh, going through till Sunday. We'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, along with some of the percussion music that you can probably hear behind me uh, right now that's really filling up uh, the Wag here this evening. But first, there's something else that we have to talk about that's happening this weekend. That, of course, the Winnipeg uh, Jets Whiteout Street Party. And yes, everyone's wondering, I think, if you're Heading out there, how you're going to dress. So, yes, we're looking at a sunny and warm afternoon at least for that whiteout party. Uh, we're looking at 13 degrees uh, by 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Sunny, southwest winds at 10. By the time puck drops at about four, uh, 6 p.m., that is, we're looking at a sunny, I'm saying 12, 13 degrees, still sunny with uh, light winds. And as we head uh, into the evening, this is why I'm going to say might want to pack a sweater, not a bad idea, mainly clear. Once the sun goes down, it's really going to kind of cool off out there and uh, eight degrees, but the winds uh, will still be light. 
we're still seeing some of that scattered flurry activity uh, and some pockets of light snow even pushing across southern Manitoba. Some nice clearing though even uh, through the Parkland region at this hour. Starting to see some of that clearing which we'll see uh, through into the later part of uh, the evening hours into the overnight period. That sets us up for a nice sunny weekend here really across Manitoba. Maybe see a few scattered flurries to the day Saturday across uh, northeastern Manitoba still. Otherwise, by and large, mainly sunny. A few clouds hanging around as we get uh, into the day on Sunday. Into Monday, some cloud starts to build in, and then we have a good chance we could see maybe a little bit more instability as we head into uh, the later part of Monday into Monday evening. Uh, right now in Winnipeg, minus one uh, north winds out there making it feel quite brisk. Uh, pressure is rising at the moment. Uh, winds almost gusting to 50 at the moment, and we'll see those winds continue to gust as we get into the evening, but diminishing a bit. But through northeastern Manitoba, Churchill in particular looking at northwest winds, 60 gusting to 80 uh, through the Shimatawa and Gillam regions could even pick up some of those higher gusts as well. Uh, here in the southern part of the province, we're looking at west winds uh, gusting to about 40 through the afternoon, so a little bit breezy. Could see some gusts up to 50 even through the afternoon. Minus 5 tonight, a clearing sky in Winnipeg. Uh, mostly sunny first thing, minus 2 and jumping up to a nine degree high tomorrow. It's certainly going to feel a lot warmer than it has been over the last couple of days. We're looking at 13 for Sunday, 12s and 11s for Monday and Tuesday. And Brittany, we are looking at uh, partly cloudy 15 degrees on the way for Wednesday. And if you like the heat, I've got uh, more temperatures like that in your seven day forecast coming up a little bit later. I am looking forward to that. Riley, enjoy the yeah. beautiful percussion soundtrack that you have. We'll check in with you a little yes. bit later. <laughs> Sounds good. The Winnipeg Jets are soaring into the playoffs on an eight game winning streak, finishing up the season last night with a 4 2 win over the Vancouver Canucks. The team and the fans are getting ready for game one against the Colorado Avalanche on Sunday. And to tee it all up for us is hockey reporter Sean Reynolds. Sean, thanks so much for joining us. Anytime, Brittany. Sean, big finish to the season last night for the Jets. They've been on a roll. How's the team looking going into the playoffs for you? They're looking quite simply like the hottest team in the NHL heading into the playoffs. And it's very interesting because if you would have gone back before those eight games that they reeled off to end the season, um, they lost six straight games and looked like a team that didn't really know what its identity was. Now, eight games left in the season, that's not a lot of time to find your identity. It usually takes some building. You don't snap your fingers. You don't do it overnight. The Jets didn't do that. It took a little bit of building. They first got that first victory then put their second together and while there were holes in their games uh, early on in that winning streak by the end of it the Jets were starting to look impenetrable especially with two massive wins against division rivals in the Dallas Stars and the Colorado Avalanche basically when you're hot you're hot and the Jets are supernova at the moment. Well, you know what? There's no time better to be hot than going into the playoffs. So 2018, we all remember that deep cup run with the Jets going into the third round. You said they're hot potential now this year for a long cup run. I would think so. And I mean, if you're drawing parallels to that 2018, the Jets again that year went into the playoffs as the hottest team in the NHL. Uh, and I take a look at the run they went on that year. They knocked off the uh, the uh, National Predators uh, in the second round of the playoffs, who were the President's Trophy winning team. And a lot of people that year thought the National Predators would be the ones to go on to win the Stanley Cup. The Edmonton Oilers after their, excuse me, the Winnipeg Jets after they knocked them off, I believe thought that themselves. They were on their way to winning the Cup. I think there was that was a young, inexperienced team and that inexperience caught up with them uh, that year. This is a team that's learned its lessons. It's looking just as dominant as that 2018 team did. This is far and away the best chance the Winnipeg Jets have had at making a seriously deep run in the playoffs maybe that we've ever seen from this team. Sean we did have a couple tough years there. What big changes did you see in the team this year compared to these last few that we had? 
I, I think it was just a mindset. I think it, a lot of it had to do with culture. Rick Bonus, when he came in and took over the team, that was to him the priority was to change the culture of this team. When we're talking about culture, I think there were times where they settled for a little bit less than they should have been settling for. They'd go on a win streak and then get, you know, maybe pat themselves on the back a little bit and kind of lose their eyes on the prize. Last year, the perfect example is they were one of the best teams in the NHL heading into mid January and then completely fell apart and almost had the biggest collapse that we've ever seen in NHL history had they fallen out of the playoffs. This year, a team that seems a lot more aware of itself and aware of the things that it needs to do in order to be successful. We call that identity in sports. The Winnipeg Jets know exactly what their identity is. They need to play hard to achieve that identity. And it's a team that is completely and fully committed to achieving that identity. So we're starting round one, Jets taking on the 2022 Cup champs with the Avalanche. How have these two teams matched up so far this season? Yeah, if I'm a Colorado Avalanche fan, I don't like the chances. And not only is it the idea that the Winnipeg Jets have beat them uh, three times in their three meetings this year and that the Jets outscored them, I believe the number is 17 to four in those three games. The Colorado Avalanche in those games, I never saw a sign of what their game would look like to succeed against the Winnipeg Jets. You want to go in with an idea of this is what we we need to be to be able to beat that team. I never saw a glimpse of what the Colorado Avalanche team would need to look like to beat the Winnipeg Jets. I don't know that they have it in them. They're an extremely top heavy team. Their goaltending isn't great. The Winnipeg Jets have maybe the best shutdown line in the league in Adam Lowry's line. So while Nathan McKinnon is the guy who can take over a series, uh, Adam Lowry may be the toughest assignment in the NHL, which maybe he won't shut him completely down but he should li uh, limit his production in this series and at that point I just think the Jets depth takes over in this series the the Jets depth just in my mind miles above where the Colorado Avalanche's depth is all right game one Sunday we will be watching thank you so much Sean anytime appreciate it to overseas now, an overnight air attack on Iran where several targets were reportedly hit, but Tehran is downplaying the strike. Was it Israel's expected retaliation? The full story after the break.
There's speculation that international pressure may be working as the world seeks to defuse tensions between Israel and Iran. An overnight attack on Iranian military facilities appears to be limited in scope. Israel has not claimed responsibility, but experts believe it was likely intended to send a message and not escalate the situation any further. CBC's Chris Brown has more from Jerusalem. The booms in the pre-dawn sky near the Iranian city of Isfahan signaled air defenses had identified an incoming attack. But it all appeared to be over quickly, and in Iran's high-value nuclear sites nearby, amateur video was posted soon after showing that everything appeared fine and secure. That messaging was repeated on state television, reporting that the intruders were shot down, no damage done. Triggered by the presence of uh, three small drones uh, that were present in that area. Other than that, nothing has happened. Israel has not commented on the attack, but if that was Israel's response, it represented a tiny fraction of the firepower Iran unleashed on Israel less than a week earlier. More than 300 projectiles were almost all shot down thanks to the combined efforts of Israel, the United States, Britain and other countries. In Jerusalem, some said they were disappointed by the Israeli move. I expected more, to be quite honest. I think more would have been even justified considering they sent 300 rockets to kill so many people. Maybe the tit for tat for now has ended. This former Israeli military officer who was once in charge of gathering intelligence on Iran says the incident has left Israel facing an emboldened Iran and a tougher security environment. Israel, we find it very hard to cope with the Iranian access alone. And I think we need our partners. And in order to do so, Israel has to move in other directions, for example, regarding the Palestinian issue, in a way that it will ease the Gulf state, especially Saudi Arabia, uh, to have normalization. In all likelihood, Israel's focus will now swing back to Gaza, where its offensive has killed more than 34,000 and displaced 1.6 million people. Many there wonder if Israel quieted things with Iran so as to open a new phase of the war against Hamas in crowded Rafah. Will Israel come from the ocean, from the east or the west or by planes? No one knows anything, said Abul Jabbar Al Arja. We have an indescribable fear. What are we waiting for? The feeling tonight is that both Iran and Israel have taken significant steps back from escalation. But with both sides still locked in the same struggle for dominance, the fear is the pause could be temporary. Chris Brown, CBC News, Jerusalem. India's national election began today. A marathon six-week vote with almost a billion eligible voters. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is seeking a third term, and his Hindu nationalist is expected to win. He currently presides over robust economic growth, but critics accuse his government of discriminating against the Muslim minority and targeting opponents with criminal prosecution. Six more voting phases are scheduled, the final one on June 1st. Jury selection is complete in Donald Trump's hush money trial in New York. It leads the way for opening arguments to begin next week in the first criminal trial of a former U.S. president. Trump lashed out once again outside the courtroom, saying the case is politically motivated. What's happening here with the judicial system is an outrage and all over the world they're watching it and all over the world they're saying it. This is a giant witch hunt to try and hurt a campaign that's beating the worst president in history. Trump has pleaded not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records. He's accused of participating in a scheme to cover up damaging stories during his 2016 presidential campaign. The allegations include payments to two women, porn actor Stormy Daniels and Playboy model Karen McDougal. Prosecutors say Trump hid the true nature of the payment. He denies the allegations and claims the money was for legitimate business expenses. This is a live look at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. We'll learn more about Art in Bloom after the break. And Riley will be back 
with your Manitoba forecast. Stay with us. Sights, sounds, and beautiful smells. The WAG has it all tonight. And that's where CBC's Riley Lechuk is out on assignment for us this evening. And my goodness, Riley, there are worse assignments to have. <laughs> Oh, definitely. Uh, you know, it's nice being out or in from, I guess, the snow that's happening outside Brittany. I'm here with Jan Burns, who is the chair of Art in Bloom. Thanks for coming on the program. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. So first, for, for someone who hasn't been here, what is Art in Bloom? So Art in Bloom, in the simplest terms, is individuals have chosen a piece of art from the collection in Wag, Come York, and interpret it through flowers. How many artists do you have on display? So we have 94 interpretations through the main floor and the galleries upstairs and 109 interpreters. So we have some classes that came out of uh, two sets of schools, the Exchange Met School and R.B. Russell. And we've had some individuals working as duos or trios and they've done an interpretation together. So this is on now for the next three days. What can people expect, I guess, when they're walking through the WAG? So when they come in, we're open till 9 o'clock this evening, and then tomorrow and Sunday, 11 to 5. So over these next two days, you can sign up for a workshop, 
uh, by coming down to the WAG. We have spaces open and you can find the information on the website for the WAG. You will hear some music from the School of Music of U of M and Brandon University. We have a flower shop. We have lots of beautiful bouquets so you can take some spring home with you. And we have Flower and Flower is here doing a pop-up with all their edible flowered baked goods. What's it like for you, when, once this is all set up and Art and Bloom is on, on, on the go here, what's it like for you seeing it just light up and look like spring in here? Well, given the weather, in one way I hate seeing the snow, but on the other way, for somebody to come down and is dying to see some spring and smell some wonderful bright smells as we see 1800 roses behind us here you get to see the creativity of Winnipeggers and individuals from outside the perimeter and their creations and it's mind-blowing how creative people are so how can people take part if, if they're in Winnipeg and want to see some spring so they come down as I said uh, they come down you can look at on the WAG website in terms of what the admission costs are um, and it's the same, it's included in your general admission. So this is not an add-on event. This is included in your general admission. So please come on down tomorrow, 11 o'clock, tomorrow, Sunday, sign up for a workshop. We have them for adult and youth. And come down and enjoy spring. Jan, thank you so much for your time and good luck with the event this weekend. Thank you so much, Riley, for having us. All right, well, let's have a look at your uh, Manitoba weather forecast, starting, of course, with that dog walking forecast, because I know everyone and their dog has probably been itching to get outside. So uh, looking at the day on Saturday, we are looking at uh, temperatures around freezing to start the day and then getting up to nine by the time we hit four o'clock in the afternoon, a mainly sunny sky. Phoebe and Kayla are our dogs for this evening. Thank you, Sharon, for sending those in. And uh, you can always send yours in as well to talk back at cbc.ca. Uh, here's a picture picture that I wanted to show you from Thompson Volker sending this one in of them digging out him and his family after that massive dump of snow through parts of northern Manitoba and uh, yes I think there'll be a lot of snow blowing happening uh, in the Thompson region and other parts of northern Manitoba through uh, this weekend getting up to only minus one in Winnipeg this afternoon uh, plus one in Brandon uh, that 11 degree high in Winkler I'm a little bit skeptical I think that might be a data error there uh, but we did get, see some temperatures uh, above freezing through the day today, plus two uh, in Thompson. Your forecast for tonight looks like this. Scattered flurries ending. We'll see clearing skies uh, basically from northwest to southeast through the province, uh, down to minus five overnight in Winnipeg and Ericsdale, as well as Brandon. Swan River getting down to minus three overnight tonight, uh, minus five overnight in Thompson. A few lingering flurries through uh, northeastern Manitoba, and yes, uh, some very windy conditions as we head through the day on Saturday. Uh, hour by hour, we're looking at uh, a main sunny start to the day. Yes, some lingering scattered flurries through northern Manitoba. We are looking at one degree in Thompson by the time we hit noon and uh, two degrees uh, by the time we hit four o'clock in the afternoon. Some scattered cloud cover. Otherwise, we're looking at a mainly sunny sky as we head through the day. In the south, a bright sunny start to the day tomorrow morning except for that northwestern corner of Ontario, Fort Francis, starting at minus two under some cloud cover. Otherwise, minus fours, minus fives for Westman, a mainly sunny sky uh, by the noon hour already getting above zero to uh, six degrees in both Brandon and Verdon, four in Winnipeg by lunchtime, and up to 10 in Portage tomorrow afternoon, and uh, nine in Winnipeg under a mainly sunny sky. And yes, we're looking at a return uh, to more spring-like weather uh, as we head into the seven-day forecast. We do have a chance of some showers uh, early on into the week as well. I'll talk all about that coming up in your seven-day forecast at the end of the show, Brittany. Riley, enjoy those roses behind you yes. for all of us. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> the death of a Winnipeg firefighter is sparking conversations about the need for better mental health support for first responders. Coming up, how his death has hit home for first responders around the province. Stay with us.
As you saw earlier, friends, family and fellow firefighters gathered in Winnipeg today for the funeral of Preston Heinbigner. Colleagues say repeatedly responding to horrific scenes, often related to Winnipeg's drug addiction crisis, left the veteran firefighter with post-traumatic stress disorder. Cameron Aubrey, Aubrey is president of the Manitoba Association of Fire Chiefs. He's also the fire chief in Dauphin and teaches mental health courses. He spoke with Janet Stewart earlier today. You say first responders are a kind of family. How has this death hit you? Um, it, it does hit close to home. Um, anytime we lose somebody out of our, our network, whether it's police, fire, EMS, um, correctional officers, any first responder, we see the impacts that happen from a, a result of going to the calls that we respond to. And uh, when we lose one of our our own, it uh, it hits everybody pretty hard. What kinds of conversations has this tragedy sparked among your colleagues, the fire chiefs of Manitoba? The biggest thing that's coming out right now is there's a lot of question about what can we do to help our, our firefighters and um, that that is a big question because when we look at the composition of the manitoba fire service um, the majority are a paid call or a volunteer network where people have other jobs or they're self-employed so they don't have access to programs that some of the career fire departments would have through a, an employee assistance plan where there is somebody to talk to and of course the smaller communities that you get into then the resources through shared health are also limited and the wait times are quite long. Is this something you'd like to change? We have been trying to progress something through the Manitoba Association of Fire Chiefs for quite some time now. Um, but, you know, it was back in um, 2016 when Manitoba passed the presumptive legislation for workers' compensation benefits uh, recognizing post-traumatic stress disorder as presumptive. So we saw that as a bit of a win. And the partnerships that we have with the Manitoba Emergency Services College and some of the courses that they teach is kind of a win. But there just has to be access to the programs that they have to be much more readily available. Um, we're looking at if somebody approaches their family doctor and they get a referral it could be months before they see a, a mental health professional and in that time unfortunately we could lose those folks so it is something we'd love to see i don't know what the answer is but uh, we'd love to work with the government and, and see what options are out there when you were saying that the wcb recognized uh, presumptive issues it's presumed that the issue that has the person off work uh, is connected to being a first responder, a responder, presumptive for issues like cancer and things that often hit our firefighters, correct? Correct. So WCB has the presumptive legislation for firefighting cancers, but they also have the presumptive legislation for post-traumatic stress disorder. And the presumptive legislation for PTSD extends to all workers. It's not just limited to first responders. And would that cover a volunteer worker? It does. Um, even volunteer firefighters uh, under provincial legislation are recognized as uh, part-time employees of their municipality. So they are covered by WCB. Every municipality covers that for anybody that's on a fire department. The problem is um, it's still the access to the wait times to speak with somebody that's a mental, uh, mental health professional, um, distance that you may have to travel as well. So being in rural Manitoba, maybe Winnipeg that you have to travel to in order to see a counselor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist because the smaller communities just don't have the resources there. We know stories like these can be upsetting. If you or someone you know is struggling, there is help. You can dial 988 from any phone in Canada to reach the Suicide Crisis Helpline or go to 988.ca. Well, still ahead, Riley Laychuk is back with one last check on the forecast and those beautiful flowers. Stay with us.
Well, we're back here at Art and Blue, which of course is on the go here at uh, WAG Kuma York all uh, weekend long here. And you can check out these wonderful roses behind me. Uh, let's have a look at that weekend forecast, starting with your day planner for your Saturday. Yes, we are expecting to see a mainly sunny sky first thing. Uh, two, minus two first thing in the morning. West winds gust to 30, and we'll see those really picking up as we get into the afternoon, all the way up to nine degrees. West winds at 50 uh, by the time we hit four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, chance of afternoon showers on Monday, a high of 12 degrees. Uh, Tuesday, we're looking at 11 degrees, uh, maybe a bit cooler by the time that whiteout party rolls around at 8.30 in the evening. But we rebound uh, all the way to 19 for Thursday and 15 for Friday, Brittany. So yes, as I've been saying all week, we return to uh, regularly scheduled spring by the time we uh, hit the later part of the weekend. Well, and you've got it inside tonight, so we're just living vicariously yeah. through you. <laughs> Thank Absolutely. you so much, Riley. You're welcome. Riley will be back here beside me on Monday with the first Jets playoff game after the first Jets playoff game. That is just 48 hours away. We sent out CBC's Jim Agapito to check in on fans and see how they're gearing up. This is tonight's Daily Lift. There's excitement in the air over Winnipeg because we're gearing up for a whiteout. I am here at the Jets gear store in Winnipeg at the Canada Life Centre talking to fans about their excitement. Go Jets, go! I am so excited. I'm a new fan, so I'm like, I've got pent up energy, yes. I think we have some pretty good chances. Um, they are a pretty good team, but I think we'll do well. Pretty excited. We're from Calgary, but I'm originally from Winnipeg, so we came for the game last night, so heading home tomorrow, so we'll have to watch it on TV, but very excited. I haven't been to a game here since they left in the um, 90s, so it was awesome. Everyone kind of never keeps us in the conversation. They write us off right away, and since we're kind of a small, smaller market team compared to Colorado, I'm seeing online everyone's kind of doubting us, but... I think our fans and kind of like we're all going out in the middle, it's snowing right now and we're going to be going to the whiteout party. That's kind of the energy that this team is going to build off. And I think we can go for a deep run. I feel like it's just a really fun, I love the energy of the city. I love, you know, I live in Wolseley so I walk to the whiteout parties and people just are honking and I just feel like Winnipeg needs to have something to be proud about and there should be other things besides hockey but hockey is a great excuse. Are you conflicted right now between being from Vancouver and cheering for Winnipeg? Um, I was never really the biggest fan of Vancouver, so let's go Winnipeg. She said it. Let's go Winnipeg. Sunday night, 6 p.m., the very first playoff game against the Colorado Avalanche. The Whiteout Street parties sold out. Lots of people going to be taking that in. We will be watching, and then we will join you right back here on Monday to recap everything. Have a wonderful weekend.